How is everyone this morning? Everybody good? Okay, everybody's had a blessed week. I think we actually just skipped right over fall, and we're going to skip straight from summertime to wintertime. So happy winter to you all. I hope that you're all looking forward to that because it looks like it's, it's about to be here. Um, but what a joyful morning it is to be in the Lord's house, and we're so glad that you all chose to be here with us to worship along with us today. Um, I want to read you one scripture before we begin, and that's simply Psalms 126, verse 3, and it says, The Lord has done great things for us, and we are joyful. This morning, I hope and pray that that is our heart's cry, that we are coming to Him with joy in our hearts, and that we are looking forward to worshiping Him in truth and in spirit today. Let's all stand together this morning as we begin our time of worship with To God Be the Glory. Sing along with us this morning. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So morning. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. God not amazingly great this morning. You may be seated. Good morning. Good job. Just a reminder today that after service we will collect a love offering to support Sarah and Nathan, so just be prepared for that. Our Wednesday night meals have begun. Last week we had a really great crowd. We had close to 50 you can go to the family Facebook page if you're on that and sign up right now. It takes less than a minute, or there's a sign-up sheet posted on the bulletin board, $7 per person, and those meals start right at 5.30. So hopefully this meal can act, can uh, help you to make your Wednesdays a little less stressful. Come to church. You can eat supper here, and I have to go home and, and cook and clean and do all that. Hopefully that this will help you get to church and bring your family to church on Wednesdays. Uh, food for Falcons still needs help. You can look in the bulletin to read about that. The youth preview luncheon is next Sunday. Sunday, and we'll also have a business meeting next Sunday. Uh, life groups begin next Sunday as well. So next Sunday is a very important day in our calendar, an important day for our church. So I hope you make plans to be a part of those events. And a reminder that our month of giving for September uh, goes directly to benefit me, Jacob, Arden Robbins, Mallory Nance, and Taylor Browning to go to Kenya, Africa. And Nathan Smith will talk about that today. So we hope that you'll give and help us to go spread the gospel to all nations. Now, Pumpkin Patch and Blue Mountain will be on October 3rd. There's a sign-up sheet posted on the bulletin board for you to bring a soup and or chili. So if you're going to plan on doing that, please sign up so we will know if we need to provide more, if we have plenty. And also, as you can see, adult choir is back. So if you'd be interested in joining the choir, for those of you who are laughing at me for singing in the choir, you can join the choir too. Uh, we're glad that you're here to join us this morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Father, thank you for today. Thank you again for our new sanctuary. Lord, it's beautiful, and we know, we know that you are glorified in it. And we pray that today as we talk about missions, we talk about the reason for the church uh, even existing, Lord. I pray that you will speak through Nathan and Sarah this morning, that uh, we will hear uh, of the fruit from their ministries, Lord, and that you will be glorified in it. Lord, I pray for those who are sick and those who are hurting, Lord. You know all the needs. I pray that you will answer those prayers in a way that you see fit. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. shout out this morning. I really appreciate that about choir. You can look up here and tell we've even got a few extra seats up here. So anytime anybody wants to join us, of course, you're more than welcome. And we even talked about we could fill that thing up with chairs. So know that we are not going to run out of room. So if you'd like to be a part of choir, um, please come be a part of that too each Wednesday night. Um, but this morning, as we continue with our time of worship, as we're focusing in today on Mission Sunday, and um, I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, you know, today we call it Mission Sunday because, of course, we're so excited to have Brother Nathan and then Miss Sarah with us today and um, talking about missions and the importance of missions. But, you know, we live out ministry each and every week, and so we have our own mission field wherever we go, and so we need to use that and take every opportunity we can to share the good news about Jesus each and every day. Let's all stand together again this morning as we continue with our time of worship with we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis the Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. As you all know, you probably know this. When we spread the gospel to one another, a fire is lit all across our community, all across our state, all across our nation. And so let's take every single opportunity that we have, whether we're school teachers and we go to school and we have those children right in front of us, take every opportunity to tell them about Jesus. If you are at work, wherever you may be, if you're in an office space, tell everyone around you about Jesus and how good he's been in your life. You never know what kind of revival could start out of those little moments that we can take and share God's good news. This morning, we're going to continue with our time of worship, and um, I hope we can see the power in the precious and great name of Jesus Christ. If you would, let's all sing your great name. Take an opportunity to tell God this morning that he is worthy of your praise. All stars say, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every No place at the sound. 
Amen. You may be seated this morning.
Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today, God, the day that is set apart in the week, God, so that your people can gather together in a place of worship, just like the one here at Fredonia Baptist Church. Father, help us to just be reminded of the importance of that, the importance of your people gathering together to proclaim your name. And God, I pray today as is the special Sunday that we celebrate and, and honor missions, God, that we would have that in the forefront of our minds. That, God, we are to gather here, but we are also to be sent out, not only to this community, but to the ends of the earth. And so, God, help us to be inspired today to do that. Help us to be led by your spirit to do those things and to, and to support those ministries. And God, I pray all this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is a special day. It is Mission Sunday. I've been looking forward to this day for, for quite some time now. And may I just remind you, I know last week I talked about our mission statement here at Fredonia Baptist Church. Our mission statement is based upon that logo that you see on the screens, those three pictures. And that is to be Christ-centered. That is to be community-focused. But it's also to be commission-driven. We want to be a commission-driven. We're driven by the gospel. We're driven by the commission to go out and share the good news. And I believe that today is going to be a great testament of that as we have two different speakers uh, that are going to be speaking about their efforts in being a commission-driven um, minister of the gospel. And so we have Sarah Reed that's going to be coming up here in a moment. And we also have Nathan Smith who's also going to share. I want to introduce Sarah for you as she'll be speaking first. Sarah is a native of Union County. We've actually supported Sarah uh, a while back. I know many of you probably know her or know her family. Uh, Sarah is a self-funded IMB missionary. Sarah has served in Portland, Oregon. Am I saying that right? Portland uh, for several years and she is gearing up now to go serve in Vancouver, Canada. And so Sarah is going to be telling you all about those things and probably so much more. We're very excited about having you, Sarah. So I'm going to invite you to, to come up, if you will, and certainly share what God's placed upon your heart. Good morning. Um, I've been crying because your worship service, you picked every song that would probably make a missionary cry. Just <laughs> So bear with me. Um, yeah, so my name is Sarah Reed, and I grew up in Union County. I graduated from East Union Attendance Center. I was one of the original Union County play participants. I was an Oki. Um, and so I have been living in Portland, Oregon the past two and a half years. Um, and I've been serving on a college campus um, at Portland State University working with students. Um, and I kind of want to just give you a broad picture, and I'm going to, I told my mom at 15 minutes, just cut me off because I want everyone to have their time. Um, but I'll share a little overview of just who I am and then what I'm going to do. Um, so I grew up here in the South, and I like to say this for the children in the room, um, because I'm just a little girl from Mississippi, and the Lord called me to reach the nations. Um, I grew up, you know, before the time I was born, I really uh, was in church. My mom and dad, I say, drug me to church as a small child. Um, but through that, I became a believer in the eighth grade. Um, and that was a really important season in my life because I thought I was a believer from the time I was born until the eighth grade. And so I share that because a bit there's a lot of people in the room who have um, their weekly activities revolve around the church, right? And we think our activities and this checklist will make us a Christian. Um, and so it wasn't until the Lord brought a friend in my life that, and I saw her relationship was very different than mine. Um, she was able, you know, she had a conviction to read the Bible and understand it. And so in the eighth grade, I surrendered my life over to the Lord. Um, and then junior year of high school, God called me to surrender to missions. And I had no idea what that meant as a little junior in high school, but I knew that I wanted my future to be the Lord's. And so whether that was my college degree, my husband, my whatever, like career path, all of those things belonged to Jesus from that point on. And so I went to college, and um, you can turn the slide if you would like to the map. Um, it's kind of an overview of my life. Um, and so I went to college, and that's where God called me to international missions and called me to China. And so I served um, as a college student overseas throughout my college career. And then after college, the Lord sent me to live in East Asia. And so I lived um, in a city there, and I worked with college students. And 
it really brought an awareness to there's such a need for the gospel. Um, and so just to give you kind of a statistic, in our city alone, um, when I started visiting my um, sophomore year of college, there were six million people. By the time I graduated and was living there, there were 12 million people. And there were over 12 campuses that we could count and that we could find on the map. And each of them had about 15,000 or more students. Okay, and none of them, I'll say none of them, but most of them have never heard the name of Jesus. And so my eyes were just wide open at such a young age to see, wow, there is a need for the gospel all over the world. And I don't know why God has chosen me, little Sarah from Mississippi, but I'm here and I'm going to go and I'm going to do what you ask. Um, and so while I was there, I had no idea what I was doing. To be honest, you never really know. The Lord calls you and he equips you as you go. Um, and so I ended up moving back to the States and went to New Orleans Seminary. And so I'm currently still enrolled and working on my theological degree uh, because I realized I needed to be more equipped um, if I'm going to share the gospel in all these different ways with all these different people. And I needed to know for myself, I needed to understand. And so moved to New Orleans and my mentor came to me uh, about two years of living there and she looked at me and she said, Sarah, I love you, but it's time for you to leave. You need to get out of the South. You need to go. Your heart is for East Asian people, and there is a world out there. And so she challenged me to um, leave. And so I ended up moving to Oregon and working um, with Northwest Collegiate Ministries, which is like Baptist Student Union here. And so I ended up serving there for two and a half years. And that whole time, I was able to work with international students, specifically Chinese, um, and see this, this thread through my life that God was faithful and continued to do that. And so now I'm about to move to Canada. Um, when I originally received the call for China and missions, I had no idea that the journey that I would be on. I had no idea that all of these roadmaps actually made sense and that there was a thread in the tapestry that the Lord was weaving my life together. Um, so I say that to all of you because Everything that you've been through, all of the things you've walked through, all make sense, and the Lord sees them, and you're in the position you are because he sees you, and he knows where you are, and he's placed you there. Um, and so I want to reiterate what was said earlier, that you're in, like missions is everywhere, and you are called to make conversation. It's really as easy as making conversation with someone. Ask good questions. People like to talk about themselves. And so hear what their heart is and hear where they're hurting and meet their need where they're hurting. Um, and so I'll share a little bit about Canada um, and what that's going to look like. Um, so I've always dreamed of being an IMB missionary and the Lord has allowed that to happen. And so I'm a self-funded missionary, and I work with the International Mission Board, and I work with Chinese students in Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada might not be something you would think of as a high population of Asians, but it's very Asian. And so we have uh, basically a lot of people from mainland China and Hong Kong have immigrated to um, Vancouver. And so we can go to the grocery store, you can go to the mechanic, the hair salon, you can do all of your day's worth of um, errands and only speak in Mandarin. And so it's really a unique place to go, and especially in North America. Um, and so I'm so excited to get to go and learn the language um, and to minister to people there. And so what part of that looks like um, one, I talked earlier um, about teams coming, and so hopefully in the future, some of you may have the opportunity to come and serve with me on the field. We have a missions laboratory, and that's where people come in, and we train them and equip them to serve on the field, um, and then in that context, you may be able to have the chance to go overseas and serve, too, in a more high-intense um, situation, maybe like actually in China, where the doors are closed and it's harder to share the gospel. You can have training here in a more open context. Um, we also train and equip Chinese believers who are there. So right now there's a group of Chinese students who are believers, and they're working with the seminary, and they've been locked out of their home country. Um, they don't speak very much English, and so our team is going to go in, and we're going to teach them English and how to share the gospel in English. So we'll be training and equipping um, and working with the churches there. Um, part of my job is receiving missions teams, and I will train and equip everyone there, and we'll go out into the field. We'll go into parks. We'll go into schools, um, colleges, and we'll share the gospel with people and have conversations. Um, and so 
that's a brief overview of what I've been doing. There's a lot to it, um, and there's a lot to my story. And so I want to close um, with a scripture and also some ways that you can connect with me after this service. Um, so a verse that I've just really clung on to for the past few years in ministry is 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. And it says, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. And so that's the goal as a believer, right? We don't want to just share the gospel and walk away from someone and not equip them, not love them, not walk them through their hard season. But we want to pair beside them and lead them to Jesus. And then when they become a believer, we want to walk with them in that journey because it's hard being a Christian. Um, In America, there's a lot of comforts, and it can seem really easy, but in other parts of the world, you can die for your faith, and so um, I just, I love that, that we, we loved you, we shared our lives, and we shared the gospel. Those things are really important. Discipleship and the gospel are really important together, Um, and so I want to give you some ways you can connect with me. I'm on a lot of different platforms, Um, so first, I have a newsletter um, that I send out monthly, and that just gives you a general overview of what's happened in the month. And so I have a sign-up sheet um, at the end of the service if you'd like that. I also have a private Facebook group where I post stories, and that you'll get names of people and get more pictures and faces. Um, And then I have an immediate text group, and this is when I'm on the field and I'm about to meet with someone. If I'm having a gospel appointment or we're setting up or whatever it is, I text that group of people and say, I need you to pray. This is what we're doing. And so in the moment, you get to be active in that ministry. And so I really am appreciative of my prayer partners in that way. Um, And then I also have a printed newsletter if you'd like it old school by mail. You can have that as well. Um, But that's an overview of who I am and just what the Lord has called me to do. Um, And I want to encourage you all because, um, well, what I want to thank you because you've partnered with me, and that meant a lot. Um, To be on the field and self-fundraise is a hard journey. I told someone earlier I'm really tired. I'm at the end of my my fundraising, um, and it's been a long journey. Um, But God has been so faithful, and I've been so appreciative to be able to share of what's going on in other parts of the world um, that you guys can partner with through prayer and through your finances because it gets the gospel to places that you might not be able to go. Um, And so that's that's a picture of the church, right? That's how we work together as a body of believers. Um, And so I'm just so thankful, and I'm going to turn it over to whoever is going to go next. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for sharing um, about your ministry, the fruit of your ministry. I really hope that us as a church can partner with Sarah and praying for her and also sending a team to join her on the mission field. That's an awesome opportunity. So, Sarah, we'll be be in touch about that. Uh, Next, I have the opportunity to present Nathan Smith to you. I'm going to warn you, he and Jeff High met in the hallway and just looked at each other because they're the exact same person, okay? (laughs) But Nathan loves the Lord, loves students. He's the founder and president, all those words that mean the same thing of Love Africa and Journey Camp that our students have been a part of for a long time. Loves people, loves missions, loves the Lord, and loves students. So uh, I'm thankful that you get to hear his heart today. Thanks, Hunter. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, we stayed, at, we stayed at Hunter's place last night, which happens to be Jeremy's old place, and almost got killed by his dog six times. It's a very dangerous place. I don't recommend it unless you're fearless. We... Uh, we we known each other a long time. Nothing I wouldn't do for Hunter, nothing he wouldn't do for me. So far, we've done absolutely nothing for each other. Um, <laughs> but no, it's an honor to be back back here. I, I spoke here for the youth when Jeremy was youth pastor. Can't believe you guys promoted him. But uh, but, but but no, I'm, I'm actually really I love your pastor. He's a he's a dear friend, a terrific athlete. Understand he's up for a bronze medal today at uh, something like frisbee or something like that. But. Uh, but no, it's, it's great to be here. How many, of you, how many of you enjoy the water? Like you love being on a boat or on a beach or on a lake. Anybody like me and they like that? It's okay to put your hand up even if you have body odor. Yes, we, we, uh, we love the water. My, my, uh, my buddy called me and, and his name's uh, uh, Steve Fronenberger. We call him Frog for short. And he said, Nate, you're not going to believe this. He goes, dude, I just bought this boat. It's a ski nautique, really nice boat, very expensive boat, over a hundred thousand dollar boat. He's like, you want to help me break it in? I'm like, dude, where where you want to meet? Like, I'm so excited about this. 
I uh, look incredibly good in swim trunks. So uh, I, got, I grabbed my trunks. He said, dude, meet me at this dock. I run down this neighborhood dock, and I'm out there waiting. And, dude, he picks me up in the nicest boat I've ever seen. It's so nice. You guys has everything you could imagine. And, and it's him, this dude named uh, Eric Rice. We call him Vanilla Rice because of a rap song a long time ago. And uh, this other dude named Chase Grindstaff who looked like he ate his family. Massive dude, big guy, looks, always looks hungry. And uh, we get in the boat, and, and I'm not kidding you, Frog is really, really good behind the boat. Like, he can do anything. He can do flips. He can do all these tricks. He's just an amazing athlete. And, uh, and basically the opposite of Hunter. And, 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 and he's, he's so good, you guys. Like, he's like, let me drive so I could, I could see him doing all these tricks in the rearview mirror. And he's doing all these flips, all this. I mean, it's just awesome stuff. And then Eric goes, and Eric's pretty good too. Vanilla Rice is sending it. He's going big air, doing all these tricks. I'm like, man, this is so much fun. They get in the boat, they're like, Nate, it's your turn. I'm like, oh no. Because I can't do flips. Like, I can't do any of that stuff. Some of you guys have abs of steel. I have abs of meals. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do that could possibly impress these guys? And they're like, Nate, you want a wakeboard? Because they're all doing these wakeboard tricks. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to wakeboard today. They're like, Nate, what do you want to do? You want to ski? I was like, I can ski, but I don't think I'm going to ski today. I said, like, what do you want to do, Nate? I said, can we blow up the tube? Because anybody, anybody could do that. You know, I mean, anybody can hang on, right? Anybody ever tube before? Raise your hand if you ever tube before. Okay, so I, I, get, on the, I, I get on the life jack. I'm, I'm trying to get that last strap to fasten. And it's, I'm sucking it in. I'm trying to get, get it to, fat, to click. And I, I mumble under my breath, wonder if I can still do it. Wonder if I can still barrel roll an inner tube. When I was in college, I used to could do this trick where like, we, uh, you could go over to Wake and you could actually flip the tube all the way over. I, I was in college. I was 25 years ago. So I was like, you know, maybe I could still do it. And Frog heard me say that. He heard me say, dude, there's no way. He said, you can't roll that tube. I said, dude, I used to do it when I was in college. He's like, there's no way you can roll my tube. He said, I bet you Outback Steakhouse right now that you can't roll that tube. And all you have to say, man, just being honest, all you have to say is steak, and I'm going to take the bet, no matter what it is. He said steak, I'm going for it, right? So, so we shook hands. He said, all right, I'll give you 60 seconds. If you roll my tube, I'll buy you a steak. But if you don't, you owe me a steak. So we shook on it. I got out on the boat, uh, out on the water, jumped in the water, climbed up on the tube. Took me about a half hour. I got on there, and, and he thumbs up means go. He dropped the throttle, y'all, all the way down. And that boat jerked me up out of the water, and I'm flying across this lake called Lake Wiley in North Carolina. And I don't know if you've ever been behind a boat, but that first turn kind of takes the tube out to one side. You know, you're going to go over the wake a little bit, and you're over on one side. Well, the next turn is kind of like the moment of truth, right? Because he cuts it hard, and there's all this slack in the line. And the boat, the rope, or the tube catches up with the boat, and the slack line jerks me back like whiplash, you know, and i holding on. Somehow I'm holding on. I hit the wake so hard, y'all, I got air. I literally got air. I'm 235 pounds. I'm in the air. Birds are flying by like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I hit the other side of the wake, and I was already upside down underneath the tube. <laughs> and fish are swimming by like, what are you doing, man? I'm like, shut up, fish. I'll catch you later. But... <laughs> I don't know how, I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand physics. I don't like math or spiders. But I, I pull with this arm as hard as I can. And somehow in that moment, I don't know if it's a momentum or what, but in that moment, I barrel rolled that stinking tube right there in front of my boys. And they stopped the boat and they were like, like did he just do that? And, I, and I'm pumping my fist. I'm like, let's go out back tonight. Didn't realize it, but while I was upside down in the tube, my trunks had come off. <laughs> Can I tell you something this morning? There's nothing more awkward than being in a boat with four dudes and you're the one that's naked, okay? Very embarrassing. Turn to the person next to you, tell them the most embarrassed you've ever been on your market set. Go, do it. Out loud. <laughs> we don't talk in church, do we? Okay, sorry. My bad. I forgot we were Fred doing ya. No, I, I, uh, I want to take you back about 2,000 years this morning to a story in the Bible that changed my life. Absolutely changed my life. It's where, 
It was where it all began, really. In fact, if it wasn't for what happened in this chapter in Luke 5, if it wasn't for this moment, we probably wouldn't be here today. Because this is where Jesus, the Son of God who put skin on, came to earth, lived a flawless life, never sinned. This is where his ministry began. Scholars say he was probably about 30 years old when his public ministry began. And he decided he wasn't going to go for a big crowd, although thousands of people would come to hear him teach at times. His primary focus of his ministry, you know what it was? It was pouring his life into 12 men, his disciples. And this is where it started. Luke 5, verse 1. If you're there, say, yep. If you're not there yet, say, hold on a second. We got Bibles in, in front in the pew. If you, if you don't, if you don't uh, have a Bible, you can follow along. Because Jackie's up there. He's got the verses on the screen. He's so good at what he does. Except very average. <laughs> Take your time. Hurry up. Where are the verses? I will come up there and wreck your life. All right, here we go. Right here. All right, so you see it on the screen. One day Jesus was standing by the lake of, of Gennesaret. You could also say Galilee. It's basically that northern lake in Israel that basically provides fresh water to, to Jordan, Israel, a lot of the Middle East there. The people were crowding in around him to hear the word of God. Here's what happened. He saw at the water's edge there were two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got in one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out just a little bit from shore, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So you can picture it, right? It's almost like a, a first century staging setup. I mean, he's got the boat out a little bit in the water so all the people can see him better. He's using the acoustics of the water to carry his voice to the crowd. They can hear him better, and there it is. In the Middle East, beautiful. The Golan Heights are, are in the east there, beautiful cliffs. You can see Syria from one side. There he is teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, let's put out in the deep water and let down these nets for a catch. Verse 5. But Simon answered, Master, we've been busting tail all night. We ain't caught nothing. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Let me ask you a question. Anybody like to fish in here? Anybody f fish? Come on, tell the truth. Okay, keep your hand up if you would start fishing if you knew every fish that you caught had a $100 bill in its mouth. You would do it. You would try it. Okay, some of y'all are rich. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I didn't mean to bother you this morning. But here's the deal. Most people don't know this. In Matthew 17, we learned about the age of these guys. Okay, most of these disciples were under the age of 20 years old. Bible scholars can argue with you, can argue with them. What about those pictures? What about those paintings where all the guys look really old at the Last Supper? Probably only Peter was over the age of 20. Nate, how do you know that? Nate, how, how, would, you, how would you possibly know? Well, in Matthew 17, you find this moment where these guys have been walking with Jesus now for a few years, and they get approached by these Jewish leaders who say, you need to pay the temple tax. It's a two drachma tax. Everybody say, two drachma. And it's, and it's for basically any man who's 20 years old or older would pay this tax to upkeep the temple. You guys did a nice upkeep on the temple, by the way. This place looks way better than it did last time. I really like it. I don't know who painted it. I don't know who set the mirror in the men's bathroom. Probably Murray because it was like right here. Um, <laughs> but, but everything else looks great. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a not, it's, this looks really nice. But that's what they're paying for. Two drachma tax. If you're a man, you work. It's about one week's wage as you pay. Help upkeep the temple. And they approached Jesus' disciples, and they're broke as a joke. Son of man had no place to lay his head. When he would travel, he was totally reliant on the people in the area. And they said, Peter, well, you, your master doesn't pay the tax? So Peter runs back to Jesus. He said, Jesus, they want us to pay the temple tax. And Jesus is like, well, we don't actually have to do it, but let's not offend them. Let's go ahead and pay the tax. And Peter's like, we're broke. We ain't got nothing. He said, Peter, go to the lake. Throw in your line. First fish you catch, check in its mouth. And you'll find enough to pay the taxes. So he finds a four drachma coin. Caught the fish real quick. Caught, wrote, reeled it in. Got the, got the, he probably didn't have a reel. But he pulled it in, right? He checks the amount. Four drachma coin. Which is enough to pay the temple tax for how many people? It's a two drachma tax. How many people? Two plus two is? That's right. So two guys. What if? What about the other disciples, right? What if they were under the age of 20 and therefore exempt? From the temple tax. What if God put skin on, came to earth, and his primary focus of his ministry was to pour his life into teenagers? He knew they could change the world. You want to be like Jesus? 
Pour your life into teenagers. Look what he's doing here. He, sa he says in this moment, he said, we ain't caught nothing, Jesus. All night we've been working. We're trying to catch fish. It's, it's the wrong time to fish. Jesus is like, let's go out in the daytime. No, we work at night. It's the wrong place. Jesus said, throw it out in the deep water. That's, that's not where we fish. It's not where the fish are. But they didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know that Jesus invented fish. And look what happens. Next verse. When they did what Jesus said, they caught so many fish that their nets began to break. Verse 7. So they had to signal to their partners in the other boat, please come and help us. And they came and filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. I like to think of pictures. When I read, I like to imagine, what was that like? What does it look like to have this happen? First, you're in a boat, and the fish are acting very strange this day. Instead of trying to get out of the net, what are they doing, Sarah? Come on. They're swimming into the nets. Who does that? Does that happen in college ministry? you got to go chase them, right? They don't, come after, they don't come to the nets, man. But for some reason that day, all the fish are like opposite of Nemo, like trying to get in the nets, right? Like, what? What is going on? And they're, they're so full. The nets are so full. They're starting to break. And you can feel the tension. You're starting to snap. No, you guys got to come help us. This is the best catch of their lives. And this is family business, man. This is what they do. Simon had these boats, man. This is what he does. This is a huge, huge blessing. And they're dragging the nets to shore. They're trying to get back to shore. Both boats are weighted down so much with the weight of that fish, they're starting to sink. And they get in the shore, and this is what happens. Simon Peter saw what happened. He fell at the knees of Jesus. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. I doubted you. I had no idea this was going to happen. For he and all his companions, they were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. That's, that's a Greek word there. Astonishment is tomazo. I want you to say tomazo. Turn to the person next to you, look them in the eyes and say, tomazo. Try it. It's a wow. It's a wow moment. It's like, whoa, what did that just happen? Like, how did that happen? Like, I've never seen anything like this. And they're looking at the nets and they're like, so full of fish. Like, Tomazo, how could this possibly be? Like, this is unbelievable. And then verse 10. So were his partners, James, John. These are also uh, uh, guys who would go on to follow Jesus as his disciples. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid because from now on, you will fish for people. From now on, you'll be a fisher of men. And not that there's anything wrong with fishing. Not that there's anything wrong with running the family business. Just so happens Jesus had other things in mind for this guy. He was calling him to be a leader. He was calling him to step forward in faith and follow him. He said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. Now, I'm one of those guys, I don't, I don't know if you're like this, but I, this is what I believe. I got saved when I was 17. My dad stopped loving my mom when I was 10. He was very abusive to, to my brother and I, physically, verbally. I mean, very much emotionally abusive guy. One time, on my 13th birthday, he put my head through a wall and kicked me down a flight of stairs. I knew at 13 I didn't care if I ever saw my dad again. I started I start running from God. I started running from everything. Couldn't understand why, why God would give me a dad who didn't love me. All my other friends who had dads, I was like, man, so jealous. But I'll be honest, at 17, I met this guy who was our youth pastor. And he was crazy, just like Hunter Little. I'm telling you. He came to my house, played basketball with me and my little brother. Made a bet with my brother. I was like, youth pastor likes to gamble? But for some reason, they made this bet. And he's like, if I beat you, you got to come to church on a Wednesday night. And my brother's my little brother, but he ain't little. He's like 6'7". And he's like, what do I get if I win? And, and the youth pastor's like, what do you want? My brother said, you got to wash my car while I watch. And the youth pastor's like, you got to bet. They shook on it. He beat my brother 16 to 3 in our driveway. Beat him like a drum. He was shooting the nastiest, ugliest rainbow shots you've ever seen. Looking like Braden. And he was shooting them up. And, and, and they were going in. He'd, he'd, he'd pull up to shoot. He's like, this one's for Jesus. And it would go in. It was, I, was, I was laughing. I was making fun of my brother. I was like, you're going to church. <laughs> this is going to be great. He talked me into going to church. We walked inside after the game. He said, Nate, w what are you doing Wednesday night? Why don't you come to church with your brother? I was like, I didn't lose at basketball. He goes, like, you want to play? I was like, no. <laughs> I know better than that, but I ended up going. He told me there were girls there and pizza. So that was all, I, all it took. Next thing you know, I showed up to the youth group, never stopped going back. My brother never went back. 
God changed my life at a summer camp that summer. I've never been the same. I became a disciple of Jesus. And I'm one of those guys who really believes this. I don't know if you believe this, but it's what I really believe. I believe that if God saves you, he also calls you to be a fisher of men. Every one of us that are believers, we're called to missions. We're called to be missionaries right where we live, right where we are in our community and even beyond. He said Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. And they scattered. When he died and rose again, he scattered them with the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples, he said. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all the things I have commanded you. It's a Great Commission. It's unbelievable. Now, this is my favorite verse. And I, I'd, be, I'd be ashamed if I, if I walked away from, from this community and didn't share this verse with you. Because this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. If you've got a Bible, underline this, circle this, memorize this verse. It's a beautiful verse. I want you to think about it with me just for a few moments before we wrap up, wrap up today. Okay? In fact, let's, let's read it out loud together. Ready? Out loud. Everybody on three. One, two, three. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. One more time. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. You ever done that? You ever just given everything to Jesus? You ever just decided that, that everything you have is, is really worth nothing without him? You ever had a moment in, in your life where you had a genuine encounter with Jesus, and like Simon, you fell on your knees, and you said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. I'm not, I'm not worthy of you. You ever had a moment like that where you said, you know what, you can have it all? They left it all, man. They left everything. The best catch of their lives, they walked away from. They walked away from their families for a time to learn from a rabbi, a teacher. But he wasn't no ordinary rabbi. He was a rabbi who could talk to fish. He was a rabbi who could heal the sick and raise the dead. He wasn't no ordinary rabbi. He was the rabbi. He was God with skin on. And they walked with him for three years until he died. On a cross for you and me, he gave his life. For all the things that we do wrong, he died. He rose again three days later. They left everything to follow Jesus. You ever done that? Well, here's what we're going to do. I want to ask you, first, first, if you've never had a moment like that in your life, maybe today's the day. Maybe today's the day where you say, you know what, God, you can have it all. I want to leave everything. I want to follow you. And here's what that looks like. It looks just like that verse a few, few verses ago where Simon fell on his knees and he gave his life to Jesus. Maybe you want to do that this morning. Maybe you want to come forward. And you know what, this is a great place right here. You can fall on your knees and you can say, Jesus, you can have it all. I dare you to do it. I was 17 years old. It changed my life forever. Yeah, there were tears. I cried that night so much. I ran down to the pond. I cried so much, literally the water rose in the pond. I just left it all behind. All my daddy issues, all my struggles with doubts in God. And I just said, you can have it all. Gave him my whole life that night. You ever done that? Maybe, t maybe today's the day. Number two, ready? Have you truly, truly, maybe you're a follower of Christ, have you truly left everything? Is there something you're holding on to this morning that maybe you'd say, you know what, God? I want you to have that. I'm sorry for holding so tightly to that. Could be a relationship in your life where you were hurt. I was, I was bitter towards my dad until I, was, uh, until I was about 19, 20 years old and had a, had a, had a reunion with him and God restored our relationship. It's, it's not perfect, but you know what? I got my dad back. That's okay with me. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe it's a, it's a financial issue. Maybe it's a health struggle. Maybe there's just something that you're holding on to this morning. You're like, you know what? I don't want to hold on to that no more. God, you can have. Maybe that's what you need to do. You need to just pray and say, God, please, please, I want you to have that. Please take that burden from me. I'm sorry for holding on to that. Please take it away. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and I want you to respond, okay, however God leads you. Will you bow your head with me right now just to show respect for, for a God in heaven, our Father, our Creator? He's in heaven, but He's here now, right? He's with us. Where two or more are gathered, there He is with us also. And if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I want God to have everything, then I want you to slip out right now, and I want you to come forward, and I want you to fall on your knees right here up front. There's no, there's no one here who's going to embarrass you. They're only going to be supportive of you. 
So if that's you, go ahead. You, you slip out right now. Come on forward right now. Fall on your knees and just say, God, please take it. Please take it all. I dare you to do it. It's time. It's, I, I wouldn't wait any longer. Go ahead and move. If you've been holding on to something and, and you're like, Jesus, please take that away. Would you please take that away from me? Would you just throw your hand up so I can see it? I can pray for you. If you've been holding on to something, I want to let that go this morning. Throw it up high. I see you guys. A ton of you. Yeah. Throw it up there. And in your heart, just say, God, will you please, will you please take that? And maybe you've prayed it a few times. Maybe you've prayed it a dozen times. Maybe you've prayed it a hundred times. This morning, I want you to say, God, just please, will you take that from me? I want to follow you with my whole heart. God, we're here this morning because of what you did 2,000 years ago. What, what you're doing now in this church is really, really beautiful. So many students at camp this summer. I, so many students every summer at camp. See the way you're working in their lives. So much fun. So much fun to follow you. Thank you for Sarah's ministry, God. Thank you for what you're doing in, in Portland, Vancouver, and East Asia, and China, God. Thank you for what you're doing in Africa. Thank you for raising up a team from, from this community to go and serve in Kenya. Wow. You're a really good God. And we don't deserve it. We ask your blessings, Father, as, uh, as we move forward in this service, as we wrap things up this morning. Would you bless as only you could? Thank you for those who have responded to your word this morning and those who will later on today, tomorrow, and the next day as we share the gospel with this community passionately, wholeheartedly. I pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen means so be it. Make it so. God, make it so. I want to, I want to just say before I walk away, uh, I'm really thankful for the privilege of being here. Every time I get to come, I really have a great time. Jeremy, you're not only attractive, but you're my friend. And I love you. Uh, I want to thank you guys for sending a team to Kenya that's so huge. We feed about 16,000 kids a day over there. So your team is not only going to be a part of, of putting food in, in kids' in kids' bellies who probably wouldn't eat a meal otherwise, but they're also going to get to go and share the gospel in villages. And we see people come to Christ every single team that goes. We're very poor, very rural area. We do a lot of work in a deaf school there. Uh, pe people that are disabled in Africa ha have it very different than, than dis disabled people here in America. We're going to be doing work. Uh, you guys are going to be doing work in a bunch of different places. You're going to get to experience a lot of different ministries. And if you want to go, I, I would say just, hey, man, I've always, God put Africa on my heart when I was a kid. Maybe come up to Hunter afterwards. If, if he's too intimidating because of his, his facial hair, then, then maybe come up to Jeremy. He can't grow facial hair. And just say, hey, I think I'd like to, like to go to Africa. And we'll get you guys on a team, whether it's this time or next time. We'd love to have you. My name's Nate. My wife's name's Levesey. She's about 5'9", comes up about right here. She has brown hair, blue eyes, and she is my righteous fox. We've been married 25 years this December, and uh, she's been praying for y'all too. So thank y'all so much for having us. That's my family. Gracie and Sophie are my girls. They're not little anymore. Um, they're people now. They're humans. They go to college. And, uh, yeah, thank y'all again for everything. Yeah. Jeremy, you want this? or? Thank you, Nate. Why don't we stand? And I know we've already responded. And I know that several of you have already responded in different ways and praise God for that. But we want to just close out our service by giving you one more opportunity to respond to what Sarah has shared, what God's laid on her heart, certainly what Nathan has shared and what God's laid on his heart. And if there is anyone else in this room, don't you leave here without first doing business with God. Whatever that looks like for you, I pray that you would respond in these next few minutes. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No No.
Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope that, again, today has just reminded you of the importance of missions that hopefully we as a church are always sending out groups and teams, but there's also individuals who quite literally dedicate their life to doing that, and I believe that we should be a church that supports them. Uh, and so I want to let you know, and you already know this, but just to remind you again at the conclusion of this service, uh, we're going to have different deacons at all the exits, and we're going to take up a love offering, and I want you to know that every single dollar or our dime or even penny is going to go directly to benefit them, directly to benefit their min ministries, whether that's in Vancouver or whether that's in Kenya. All, all of those proceeds, every bit of that money is going to go directly towards them. And so you are helping them and supporting them in those ways. And so I would encourage you uh, to do that as you leave. Beyond that, just keep in mind all the different things going on in our church. Be sure to sign up for our meals uh, this coming up Wednesday night. You can do that again online or on the sheet behind you. The cutoff is this Sunday, so keep, in, uh, keep that in mind as you go about your day. And then also keep up uh, with all the information with the life groups happening next, uh, this coming up Sunday. And so we're looking forward to that as well. Again, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to close you all out in time of prayer, and you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, again, we're just so humbled, so grateful, God, to be in your house. God, to know that your presence is with us right now. And God, certainly we experience that firsthand through your spirit working in, in the life of Sarah, working in the life of Nathan. God, hearing what you're doing, not only in the Ingemar community, but around the world. And God, I pray that we would understand that, that Christianity, is, it's not just about what's going on here, but God, it's about what's going on throughout the world. It's the ends of the earth. God, you want us to reach all people. And so, God, help us to be a church that sins. Help us to be a church that supports those who dedicate their lives to share the good news of the gospel. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.